Welcome everybody, this is ESO Recapped, episode number 13. I am Defatank, I am joined by special guest Layanum. I've got Dubba in here, and we've got Curse. Uh, these are some of the guys that have been helping quite a bit with uh, the PTS testing, long-term test group. Uh, Curse, very experienced guy with the uh, the Dragon Knight, using it as a mage top build. Lanum actually is using a Sorcerer with a two-hander and um, uh, kind of like a tankish build DPS. And Dubba in here as a Templar with uh, healing. And myself playing a Dragon Knight tank heavy sword. So just want to give those guys introductions of who all is going to be part of this uh, this episode. There is a lot of stuff that I've got to go over, so this is probably going to be a very long episode. The basics of what we're going to be going over uh, this week and next week both is going to be the class skills. Trying to help you guys understand the classes and what you need to know about them and how they work. So that's going to be the focal point. For this episode, we're going to break down the Dragon Knight and the Templar, and I've also got some stuff about Adventure Zones and, of course, some questions that came up from uh, last week. So to get started, the quick points, we got Atman Coast, or Cost, I should say, from YouTube. He asked, is there a limit on the number of task boards you can get from Quest from Daily, or can you just keep running them and get task quest from each of them? That is question is in regards to PvP. Uh, from last week where I talked about Cyrodiil and the task boards picking up quests from them. You get four quests from the task boards, and that's it, plus the one from the Warlord. When you complete those quests, you can go back and turn it in and pick up another quest. Those quests do change with the exception of killing enemy players. That one is pretty much always the same. So hopefully that answers that question. Sean from Facebook, he's asking, what do the colors of the text mean on items. Uh, basically what it is, is it's the rarity of the item. And I want to get in game here. That's what I was setting myself up for there earlier. Alright, as you guys can see, I'm just hanging out at uh, one of the blacksmithing sections right now. I've got a couple of items already in here, and this is what he's referencing. You've got these calcinium gauntlets. They are a white. The text is white on them. And then you've got these calcinium greaves of stamina. The text is green. And that is just the uh, rarity of the item. If you go into the improvement section, it breaks all this stuff. Blue, purple, and yellow. White items is normal. Rarity. Uh, it's very common. All of your crafted gear will start out as white. The next level up is green. So whenever you use, for instance, in blacksmithing, you use the honing stones to upgrade the item from white to green. Then you can use the dwarven oil for blacksmithing to upgrade the item from green to blue. You can use the grain solvent, which is a purple rarity item. It will upgrade an item that is blue to purple. And then you can use the tempering alloy uh, to upgrade an item from purple to legendary, which is the top uh, rarity item. The next question comes in from Daniel Anderson. He's having problems finding honing stones to make armor better. He's asking, uh, where can you search for them? Well, the best place to find these, they come from multiple places. Number one, breaking down uh, rarity items. So if you break down a green rarity item, you have a chance of it yielding green rarity upgrades or improvement uh, materials blue breaks down to blue and etc. You can also search like heavy sacks uh, running around in dungeons you'll sometimes find them there and also whenever you refine ore uh, whenever you just take your raw ore materials make them into bars bam you can get uh, the improvement materials from that and lastly the hireling which comes from the crafting tree and all of these have this for the uh, blacksmithing, clothing, woodworking you got this miner hireling, and he will actually bring you materials every 24 hours. You do have to be logged in in order to get that mail sent to you. You being offline for two weeks, you're not going to come back and have two weeks worth of materials sitting there waiting on you. You do need to log in every 24 hours to get it. And as you increase it, you just get uh, more materials out of it. 
So that, that is another way that you can get them. I also want to note that there is this metal extraction. All right, You can um, get this and it will actually increase your chance of getting these improvement materials. When you break down the green item, it's going to give a better chance of getting that green uh, material. So that is really good to have and it, it does help. The last quick point that we're going to is uh, questions that's come from a lot of fans. What types of items or services can we expect to find in the Zenimax store? This is in reference to the online store that um, everybody's been asking about that everybody thought it was going to be uh, pay to win basically. This is from Matt Farrar with an interview with Zam. Okay, That question was asked to him and his response was two things to start with. You'll be able to upgrade to the Imperial Edition and there will also be a Palomino horse. That is not the Imperial horse. So the only way that you can get the Imperial horse is to order the Imperial Edition or upgrade to the Imperial Edition. That will get you the Imperial horse. The purpose of this Palomino horse is for those people that want that starter horse at level one, they've got an outlet to be able to get that horse if they don't want to wait to spend 17,000 gold. So they've basically given you guys an area to get that horse if that's really what you want without having to buy the Imperial Edition. We don't know how much the horse is going to cost or anything like that. More information is going to come on that. So that is where the store is going. So nothing in there pay to win. Now on to the main point as my cat puts his tail right in the camera. Sorry about that. The main points uh, of episode number 13, Adventure Zones. This is something that a lot of people have been really, really interested in and want to know about. Well, here you go. This is the basics. This is the Adventure Zone that you're going to be finding in the Elder Scrolls Online. The name is Craglorn. It is two-thirds the size of a normal zone. For those that's not good with uh, fractions, that's about 66%. So if you looked at Deshaun, okay, which is a normal zone, Craglorn would be about 66% size-wise comparison to Deshaun. Deshaun is pretty big. So take any starting area out there, you know, that you're running around in doing your quest, and uh, just take over half of that and that is your adventure zone. This is the stuff that is comparable to raids, mind you. So th this is very, very big stuff. It's primarily built for four player groups. And that is a huge thing to note is four player groups. When you step into this thing, you better have four people in your group. That's the way it's built for. You're gonna be coming across things called trials. Uh, it's built for 12 player groups, these trials are, and this is what's built more so in the scope and difficulty uh, to a raid in other MMOs. Something else that this Adventure Zone does, you guys heard about veteran ranks that I talked about in previous episodes, Adventure Zones actually increase your veteran rank past VR10, veteran rank 10, so you'll go from 10 to 11, 12, however many ranks there is we've not been told exactly how many there are but uh, you know that is what you're looking at for the adventure zone and as you can see you know you've got way shrines in here you've got some little dungeons that is all around here some temples uh, towns are inside of this thing as well and I mean alien ruins plus there's other stuff around here that doesn't have any markings on it who knows what it's going to be used for but uh, a lot of really good information. This was some information that came off of ESO Head, so uh, it was really cool to see this information and put it into scope. That you know you're looking at 66% is the size of this thing versus a, a zone that you've leveled up through in the game. It's massive. So it, I'm really really hopeful for Adventure Zones. That's some really good information to have out there about it, and uh, I expect Zenimax to probably be sending us some some good information about Adventure Zones maybe next week. We'll just have to wait and see what they say, but uh, really good information there. Um, but I want to do this to help you guys uh, selecting your classes. I know that a lot of people are still up in the air about classes and you know what should they play. I, I've been getting a lot of questions of what what's the best class for uh, this race and things like that. 
so what we're going to go over is episode 13 is dragon knights and templars episode 14 i'm going to break down the night blade and the sorcerer i'm going to be covering each active and passive and ultimate ability in each of these skill lines just generally speaking i'm not going to go over the exact specific numbers of everything just a general overview of what these abilities do and the is to try to help you, uh, if you're undecided about a class, better understand how these abilities work and what those abilities can morph into if you choose to morph them. So remember, morphing, just a quick overview if you missed it from previous episodes, you can morph any active or ultimate ability. Passive abilities do not morph. So whenever I start talking about the, I'm gonna go over the main ability first, just a general overview of what that base ability does. Then there'll be two more abilities that I will label off and I'll be saying or. So that is the morph itself. So you'll have the ability followed by the first morph selection followed by the second morph selection. You cannot select both. You can either choose to do none or you can pick one or the other. So what we're going to start off with here is the Dragon Knight. This is actually my veteran rank 2 Dragon Knight that I've been playing on the PTS. We're going to dive right into his Ardent Flame class skill line. The first thing that you're going to see uh, is the ultimate up at top. That's going to be the last thing we hit on, active abilities. So the first one is Fiery Grip. It's actually already morphed. You're seeing extended chains. So for Fiery Grip, all right, that's the first thing that you're going to unlock. It says it pulls a target to a player and deals damage. You can morph this to the next attack will do additional damage or you can get extended range. That's what you're seeing here. This is the extended range. Next is Searing Strike. This is a flame damage, so you get an initial flame damage. Then there is also a flame damage over time effect. You can morph it to where it, the damage over time increases as time ticks or you can have it give a healing effect back to your character whenever the effect ends. Next you've got Fiery Breath. Fiery Breath will do initial fire damage in a frontal cone with a damage over time effect. You can morph it to where it reduces enemy armor or increased fire damage from abilities. So really good morph there uh, either way you take that. Next is Lava Whip which uh, is fire damage, initial fire damage and it also sets any immobile or stunned enemy off balance. The morphs for Lava Whip are while the ability is slotted, you deal more damage with fire attacks or life steal following up an attack. Next is Inferno. Inferno is an AOE flame damage every one second and it costs Magicka for each second it ticks. So this thing is gonna tick your Magicka down as it's dealing damage every second it's activated, toggled on if you will. The morphs increase crit chance on an affected enemy or restores Magicka when nearby enemies die. So that's some pretty good abilities. Next we're going to go over the passive abilities in the Ardent Flame line. The first one is Kindling. Kindling increases the damage of burning effects. Warmth is the next, next one. It is damage with Ardent Flame abilities uh, apply a snare effect. So whenever you use Ardent Flame abilities, it's going to snare targets. Next is Searing Heat. This increases the damage and duration of Fiery Breath, Searing Strike, and Dragon Knight's Standard. Lastly, in the passive line is World in Flames. This increases damage of fire area effect abilities. And something else to notice, just in case you don't remember about passive abilities, these things are always on given that you meet the requirements for it. Nine times out of ten you will, but you'll see as I go through some of the other lines that things will say when using this you get these effects. So that's something to note about passives. There's nothing to activate with them. They're always on. Lastly, with the Ardent Flame abilities, is you have the Dragon Knight Standard. Dragon Knight Standard says enemies take fire damage every second. This is the ultimate now, mind you. Enemies take fire damage every second. They receive less healing 
So anyone within the range of Dragonite Standard will take less healing as well while they're taking fire damage. It also has a synergy effect of Shackle, which does damage and immobilizes. So you got all of that stock with just the, the base ability. Next, you can morph Dragonite Standard to where the standard can be moved, or it increases the damage done and reduces the damage taken. So pretty big uh, ability there uh, with the Dragonite standard. It, it's very useful. Next we're going to move into the Draconic Power line. Draconic Power, starting off you're going to have Spiked Armor. Spiked Armor, this is active abilities, increases armor and return damage to the attacker. So you're going to buff your armor and you're going to make damage go back to whoever's hitting you. It can be morphed to where the damage reduction is increased on activation or it deals damage when you activate spiked armor. Next is Dark Talons. Dark Talons is an AoE immobilization of nearby enemies and damages them. It also has a synergy where it uh, damages enemies held in the talons. Just in case you guys aren't familiar with synergies again, I know I did cover it in previous videos, just so that everybody is aware, synergy effects are activated by other players in your party. You cannot activate your own synergies. So that keep that stuff in mind when I'm talking about these synergies. Next is Dragon Blood. Dragon Blood heals you for a percentage of your health points. It increases your health point regen as well. It can be morphed into armor and spell resistance is increased or increases stamina regen while active. Let me get away from these NPCs talking. That guy's annoying. Next is going to be reflective scale. Reflective scale reflects all spells for a short period of time. It can be morphed to increase spell resistance or increase the damage of reflected spells. Last active ability in Draconic Power is called Inhale. Inhale absorbs health from each enemy nearby enemies after a short period of time. So you're going to absorb health from each nearby It will deal damage to those nearby enemies. You can morph this into where it will interrupt and stun and increased damage. I got a better idea. Quiet, quiet. There we go. Everything's quiet now. My apologies about that, guys. So, inhale, let me go back over that real quick, absorbs health from each enemy and enemies after a short period of time. It deals damage to nearby enemies. You can morph it to interrupt stuns and increases damage or restores magicka for each enemy hit. Next is going to be your passive abilities in the Draconic line. So you've got Iron Skin starting off. Iron Skin blocks additional damage. Next you got Burning Heart. It increases healing received. Next one is Elder Dragon. It increases your HP, which is health pool regen or hit point regen for each Draconic ability slotted. Last is Scaled Armor. Scaled Armor increases your spell resistance. As far as your ultimate in the Draconic skill line, you've got Dragon Leap. Leap will allow you to leap to an area, deals AoE damage, and all affected em enemies by this are knocked back. You can morph this ability to increase range or gain spell resistance for a period of time. So again, pretty cool abilities with that ultimate. Lastly, we're going to get into the Earthen Heart for the Dragon Knight, and then we'll go into Templar. For the Earthen Heart active abilities, the first thing you're going to see is Stone Fist. Stone Fist uh, deals damage and knocks down an enemy. You can morph it to where it has increased range or gain armor after casting. Next you have Molten Armament or Molten Weapons. Increases weapon damage of nearby allies. The bonus is increased by 100% on yourself. So you're going to increase your allies damage and you're going to double your own damage. Basically, that's what you're doing. The morphs 
light and heavy attacks add fire damage or you can add crit strike chance so that's some very good buffs uh, going out to your group obsidian shield next you've got uh, it creates a damage shield on all nearby allies shield strength increased by 100 percent on the caster you can morph it so that it absorbs more damage or deals damage when the effect ends next you got petrify this stuns an enemy it's a long-term stun if the target takes a certain amount of damage stun you can morph this ability so that it reduces the enemy's HP stamina and magicka regen or you can make it to when the effect ends nearby enemies take damage and have a chance to be set off balance last active ability in the earth and heart line is ash cloud ash cloud snares enemies and increases their mist to where it deals damage to enemies in the area or disorients enemies in the area so you can either do damage or get a little bit of CC off of that passive abilities for the earthen heart first you got Inter eternal mountain this increases the duration of earthen heart abilities Next, you got Battle Roar. When you use an ultimate, it restores HP, Magicka, and Stamina. Really good ability. Or really good passive, I should say. Next is Mountain's Blessing. When activating Earth and Heart abilities, it gives ultimate. So whenever you activate any kind of Earth and Heart ability, you build ultimate. Lastly, you got Helping Hands. This restores Stam, uh, or Stamina when activating Earth and abilities so again it works kind of like mountain blessing in a way when you use earth and heart if you had mountain blessing and helping hands you're going to be building ultimate and getting some stamina back as well so those two paired up pretty good last thing is the ultimate in the earth and heart tree is uh, magma armor magma armor caps incoming damage based off your HP it's an AOE dot every second so you're gonna cap off max damage based off your HP and do a dot every second AOE dot with it you can also uh, morph this to where allies can activate a synergy granting powerful damage shield so they get a really powerful damage shield or you can have it to where it reduces the power of nearby enemies so they would so that is your Dragon Knights. Uh, all of his active, passive, and ultimate abilities broken down and what they morph into. Understanding of how you can use the Dragon Knights abilities uh, with your weapons, your racials, or, or whatever abilities you want to use. I think it's really good for you guys to be able to see these morphs early to help make a decision if the Dragon Knights appropriate for you or not. What we're going to do now is I'm going to switch over to a Templar. So we're going to have a little bit of a break while I switch over to the Templar, and we're going to go through his abilities as well, just like what we've done. Break those down, see what the ultimates are, and check out his, uh, his active abilities, passive abilities, and like I said, those ultimates. Elevator music. <laughs> and don't worry, guys, whenever um, this video is available on YouTube, there's going to be timestamps. So if there's something specific about these abilities and hone in on, click those little timestamps in the description. You can jump right to it. All right, so now we've got my Templar. This is my. He's uh, level 15. This is also PTS. We're going to start off in the Adric Spear line. Active abilities first, of course. First thing in the Adric is Puncturing Strikes. Puncturing Strikes is four consecutive attacks, damages enemies in front of you. The closest target takes additional damage and is knocked back. To do critical hit chance increased versus low HP enemies or damage dealt in a large cone. So instead of it just being a straight line, it's now a larger cone effect hitting more enemies. Next you got Piercing Javelin. 
Piercing Javelin hurls a spear. It does damage and knocks back. It can be morphed based on the distance from the target. Um, the other morph is increased knockdown duration. So if you throw it from a farther distance, it's going to do more damage, or you can increase the time that the person is knocked down with that morph. Next is Focus Charge. This charges an, a target. It interrupts the cast if they're casting something and stuns them. It will also do damage. The morph is it deals damage to all enemies at the point of impact or enemy is stunned on impact. So you got like a little AOE damage or stunning the person that you charged. Next is Spear Shards. Spear Shards deals damage to enemies. It's an AOE. It disorients one target. It has a synergy effect where ally, an ally can pick up the spear. It grants them stamina and stamina over time. More stamina and magicka. The second, or the alternate morph, I should say, is it stuns instead of disorient. Last thing is Sun Shield. Sun Shield is a damage shield based on your max HP. It deals damage to nearby enemies, and each hit increases the shield's strength. You will not regenerate magic while this is active. You can morph it to where it deals additional damage on activation or deals when the shield ends based on the damage it absorbed. Now your passive abilities in the Adric Spear line. You have Piercing Spear. This increases the crit strike chance, increases damage versus block targets. So you got some crit strike chance from it and you're increasing damage if the target is blocking. Spear Wall passive says it increases the block amount versus melee attacks. Burning Light, when using Adric Spear, abilities increase the chance to deal additional magic damage. Lastly is Balanced Warrior. Balanced Warrior says it increases weapon damage and spell resists. Lastly is Radial Sweep for the ultimate. Radial Sweep says it deals magic damage oops, let me get up here on it deal magic damage to all nearby enemies uh, and it can be morphed so that you gain armor for each enemy hit or deals additional damage to enemies in front of you so you got an AOE swing there uh, that you can either gain armor for a tank or uh, if you just want more armor for instance or deal additional damage for anything that's in front of you. Next is going to be Dawn's Round. Set my notes here so I can read. Alright, Dawn's Wrath. First, you have Sunfire. Sunfire is straight fire damage, direct immediate fire damage. It also has an additional fire dot and it snares. You can morph it to where it deals increased damage over time. Or you can have it affect mul multiple targets. Next is Solar Flare. Solar Flare is uh, magic damage to a target. Next attack gains weapon and spell power against that target and nearby enemies. This bonus does not apply to Solar Flare or its morphs. The morphs for Solar Flare are affected enemies receive less healing or there's no cast time and it deals damages deals damage to enemies near you. Next is Backlash. Backlash is a target enemy stores up damage taken when the effect ends they receive additional damage. The morphs it heals allies in the area or you can have it gain weapon power when attacking an enemy target. Eclipse is the fourth active ability. This is a target uh, you, you hit it with a hit a target with Eclipse that target reflects negative single target spells back at themselves for a short period of time. You can morph this into the enemy deals less damage when the effect ends 
or the target deals damage to all nearby enemies when the effect ends. Lastly is Blinding Light. Blinding Light says nearby enemies have the chance to miss and will be set off balance. The morphs is it adds damage or it applies to nearby enemies. Now the passive abilities in Dawn's Wrath you have Enduring Rays. Enduring Rays increases the ability duration. You will see right here while using Dawn's Wrath ability. Hey, that's a typo. I've got to bug that. When using Dawn's Wrath ability, increases ability duration by 10%. Prism says when using Sun ability, be on activation. Next you have Illuminate. Illuminate says its spell resistance is increased if the attacker is affected. Restoring Spirit is the last passive in the Dawn's Wrath. It reduces ability, magicka, stamina, and ultimate cost. And now the ultimate for Dawn's Wrath is known as Nova. Nova says enemies deal less damage, they take a dot, and it has a synergy that says it deals damage and stunning all enemies in the area. So when you lay down Nova, they're going to start dealing less damage, they take damage over time, and a synergy can be activated by your party members to deal more damage and stunning everybody. So really cool. It can be morphed so that allies may activate an even more powerful synergy effect, or it will snare enemies standing in the area. Restoring Light Tree. Restoring Light does a lot of healing and it's got some pretty good stuff in here. So the first active ability in Restoring Light is Rushed Ceremony. Rushed Ceremony says it heals a nearby ally. It can be morphed to restore Magicka when healing low health allies or heals up to three targets. Healing Ritual heals nearby allies. It heals self for an additional amount. You can morph this to increase your self-healing or additional. Next is Restoring Aura. When slotted, increase stamina and health regen. When activated, uh, it increases health and stamina regen of nearby time. This can be morphed to have increased radius or it has no cost, consumes essence of corpse to restore health and stamina. Next is Cleansing Ritual. Instantly removes negative effect from yourself over a long period of heals every two seconds. It has a synergy effect of Purify. Purify removing all negative effects. You can morph this so that it uh, has reduced cost or, remove, or reduce cost and removes additional effects. And the other morph is it has increased duration. So you can reduce the cost, remove additional effects, or... Lastly is Rune Focus for active abilities. It says that it creates an area of self-protection over a long period of time. It increases armor and spell resistance. It can to restore Magicka while in the focus. Or you can receive more healing while in the focus. Your Restoring Light line are Mending. Mending, when using Restoring Light abilities, you increase crit strike chance of allies. The value increases the more HP the ally is missing. Next is Focused Healing. It says it increases healing power of allies standing in an area of protection created by message, Cleansing Ritual, or Rune Focus. Lightweaver is the third passive. It says it increases duration of restoring aura, reduce cost of uh, reduces the cost of healing ritual, it gains armor and spell resist while channel channeling rod of passage. Last passive ability is Master Ritualist. Master Ritualist says it increases resurrection speed. Affected allies resurrect with more HP you have the chance to gain a soul gem upon successful resurrections. The ultimate for the restoring lot is Rod of Passage. 
Rite of Passage says it heals allies and nearby allies over a short period of time quickly. You cannot move while channeling this ability. The morphs is the allies take less damage while the allies take less damage when the effect ends or it increases the channel duration. So there is your Dragon Knight and your Templar lines all broken down. I've gone over the morphs, you know, giving you that extra insight of what these abilities do exactly. This is something that I hope really saves a lot of people some time when it comes to selecting their class. You know, these the weapons, you're free to relearn your skills with weapons. Your uh, your undaunted line and things like that. You, you may pick up something you don't necessarily like, you know. But once you select that class, that character is going to be that class. You know, no matter how many times you reset, in the long run, if you don't like something about a class, you're going to have to re-roll. You can't go back and pick a new class. So that's why I really wanted to take the next two weeks before launch comes out and really go through these abilities and give you guys the insight of what and ultimate abilities do on the short term and in the long term when you start morphing them out so hopefully these videos will really really help some people make some decisions on what class they want to play and uh, you know help them starting out in the game so what I want to do now I know I've went a little bit longer than what I normally go uh, there was a ton of information that I had to go over in this but I want to open it up to anybody that's sitting and watching the stream right now if you have any questions about Dragon Knights and Templars, feel free to ask. We got some pretty experienced guys in here with Dragon Knights and Templars, and uh, also Adventure Zones. You know, I don't really know a lot more than what I've given you about Adventure Zones. Cinemax has been really quiet about what we know, but if you want to ask anything about the Adventure Zones, go ask. And uh, you know, anything about crafting? You know, I covered some crafting stuff earlier. If you got any questions that you're not clear about on what I mentioned? Go ahead and let me know now. Uh, the guys that are in here, Lanham, Dubba, and Cursed, do you guys want to add anything uh, over what I went over as well? I got a question for you. All right. <clears throat> and I'm going to pose this question uh, because it's been asked of me a lot, so I'm, I'm sure somebody's going to be watching this and, and ask the question. What does it mean when you say... When you have a character and you don't like the class, you have to re-roll. What does re-roll mean? Re-rolling basically means you delete the character. You have leveled the character up to, say, 10 or 20 or whatever. And if you don't like something about it and you're just like, I don't really like this build, you simply log out of the character, delete it, and you go back through the character creation process again, select a different class, you know, and re-roll. You're redoing everything all over again, starting from scratch. The classes are versatile, but at the same time, I can see where people might play a class a little while and go, yeah, this one really isn't what I thought it was, and no matter what I do with it, maybe I should try something else. Yep, and that that's really, you know, something that I've seen myself in the PTS, you know, and listening to you guys, everybody, you know, myself playing, listening to you all, how you play your classes and the abilities we started unlocking and things, you know, I've not seen every single morph itself. I've, you know, went to forums and things like that, trying to find all of these abilities to be as correct as I can possibly get to get because trying to see it on one character that has seen it all. It's next to impossible. I mean, there is so much that you can do with these characters, and these skills go so deep in the morphs. I I seen it's like it's going to be very easy for someone to start this game, you know, get to level fifty and really start opening up these characters, and they see, I really love this weapon. I really love, you know, the 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 undaunted line or something like that, but. I really wish I'd have went with this ability to go along with it. You know, they may have rolled a, a low-level character or something that, you know, is, let's say they start with a Dragon Knight and they like it, they level it up to Veteran Rank, and then they say, well, I'm going to roll a Dragon Knight, see what it's like, and then they see this really awesome ability in the Dragon Knight tree, 
or in the uh, the knot blade tree that you know would have been great instead of them being a knot blade or a, a dragon knot. I'll get it straight. What I'm trying to say is that's what I wanted to focus on because this class is an an important decision for you know what you select. I mean. People could very well not even use nothing with their class. Absolutely. That's a possibility. But most people are going to find something in their class skill line that they're going to want to use. And that's really the purpose of these videos here uh, for the next couple of weeks. <laughs> um, for everybody out there who reads the different forums and you see what people say, something that I see a lot of times is, oh, this class can't DPS or this class can't tank. Don't listen to the hype. They can all tank. They can all DPS. They can all heal. If you know what you're doing, if you wrap your head around the skill lines and figure it out. Best example for me is I've seen people say, Nightblade's DPS isn't all that good. Well, the Nightblade skill lines aren't necessarily about the DPS. But if you pick the weapons and you get the weapons you need to DPS and you use the abilities from the Nightblade class to uh, drop aggro, avoid detection, things like that, it's all learning how to enhance and play your tune. Don't believe people when they say, Oh, this class can't do this. One of the right, beauties right. of the game, and also one of the downfalls, is that there are tons of options. So it's easy to get buried underneath it and kind of spread yourself too thin. Figure out something you like to do, figure out how to do it well, and then expand from there. It's all about choices in this game. That's beautiful. Yeah, and to, to add to that, you know, I myself, had, whenever I started the PTS, I immediately wanted to make a character that could do it all that could tank that could dps that could heal just everything i wanted it all and that was the way that i set out that was how i made my character i made all of my attributes even you know i started things with the sword and board mixing with resto staff it's like i can throw some dps in here this ability does some good damage things like that and it's not useless I think that there's probably a way to really make it work, but the thing that I found out whenever I tried to do that is I was spreading myself across so many things that to me it felt like I wasn't being as effective as what I could have could be. You know, it, it's so hard to explain, but it, it just felt like that I was doing really not the right thing by trying to be an expert in everything. Here's a good way of explaining that, just for me personally. The game is designed, and if you accumulate all these skill points, you can tank, you can DPS, and you can heal. You just can't do them well all at the same time. Right, right. Each class, each role, depending on what you're doing, requires a different set of armor, requires a different set of weapons. You just can't do it all at the same time. Attribute I, points. I think that where you get into the most trouble, something that I've seen, and I think that this is really what made it feel like it was so ineffective is the fact that it's sitting there trying to tank and then it's like okay I've got a little bit of extra resources I'm going to throw in some additional DPS and then all of a sudden I'm like whoa somebody just took a massive hit and you know I'm close to him let me try to get a heal in you know I switch over and I try to heal now I'm out of resources I'm like oh my god I just put myself in this predicament because I tried to play hero and do everything and you know I don't think that that's really the intention to play that way. You know, you've got to trust your teammates and you've got to use everybody's abilities to your advantage. You know, stop trying to be a hero over everything. Like tanking, I've always tanked to control everything. Like I wanted to control every single mob on the floor. And it is right next to impossible to do that in this game. I mean, among just basically getting one shot for trying to do that it's really hard to try to control all of them at the same time because uh, aggro is just all over the place and you really just have to learn to focus on what needs to be hit and I think that that really leads to the next question I started out with of what race is the best tank what race plays best as a as a dragon knight or and some that question got asked so much to us in the stream over the past two weeks and the answer we always keep coming back to is don't let the race dictate how you're going to play you know you need to explore your class you need to understand what you're getting into with the class the weapon uh, skills that are out there 
all the other skill lines that are out there. How can you use those to your advantage for how you want to play? Then look at that racial tree. Is there something there that, you know, is just the cherry on top? You know, so many people has been used to MMOs telling them you got to select your race first, then you select your class. That dictates how you play. Not in ESO. You know, you select your class as a foundation of how you want to begin playing. They they each have strengths and weaknesses that other classes don't have. So you start there. But as you start playing, you start expanding out and you start experimenting with other skills and other skill lines and abilities and you start really seeing the possibilities of this game and how widespread you can get. But it still comes back to these class skill lines. Whenever you get all these other skills, it's like, okay, now that I've got all these other skills and you're exploring these other skills, you start looking back at your class. Well, what what does my class offer to help these other skills that I've got that I really love now? That's where I think the people long term is going to make the mistake, and I hope this these videos help that. Is they will understand now they can wrap their brain around, you know, I've got all these other skills available to me. These skills is what I really like. What can my class do for me to help me with these abilities? What can my race do for me to help me with these other abilities? There is a ton of choices out there that you can make uh, with all those skills. Would you guys agree? I just want to say that play the race you like. Because yeah. so many of the racial bonuses, people are like, oh, I get extra stamina from this. Or I get all oh, extra health from this. With the soft caps in place at end game, it's not going to matter because you're going to hit that cap. You'll just hit it sooner than else. So play the race you want. If there's something there that really grabs you, of course, roll with it. But so much of it, like you were saying, what's the best race for this? What's the best? It's no best. It's all about your play style. It's all about what you enjoy doing. Yep. There's plenty of other min-maxes to do in the game. Play the race you want to play. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Uh, I really do agree. I don't think that these racial skills are going to, you know, just break the game so hardcore because we got into this discussion the other night of basically any ability you choose out there there is another ability somewhere in these lines that will counter that ability beyond belief and it's a beautiful thing to be able to see that that there really is not a perfect cookie cutter build and the reason the reason I think that you get that is because the game has opened up so much long term that you have access to so many different skills out there uh, that anybody can use. The only thing that's restricted is your class skills. And that's again why I said long term this decision is going to be huge for people. Because uh, that, that's something, there is three skill lines that is exclusive to you because you chose that class. And that makes nine other skill lines that you can't access. So you better be sure whatever you're selecting is going to be able to benefit you long term in some way or another unless you found a perfect build that doesn't even use classes which that could be entirely possible but uh, I'm not seeing any kind of other questions out there in the chat I'm sure that everybody is playing the the beta right now and I don't blame them one bit so uh, you know this this video is going to be uploaded to to YouTube and uh, I'll put the timestamps on there hopefully that'll help you know people that's just in the Templar they can go watch that or they can go watch whatever portion of the video they want so I, I hope that that really does help guys next Saturday uh, like I said I'm gonna cover the Nightblade and the Sorcerer we're gonna do the same thing we're gonna go through their active passive and ultimate abilities just like what we have done just a general overview of them and you know give you the ins and outs of what you can expect those classes to do and how you can use them you know is up to you you need to look at all these other lines and make a decision because it's coming the game comes out in what is it like 15 days yeah 15 days now so it's coming it, it's on our heels but uh, if nobody else has anything to add, we'll go ahead and close episode number 13, get it uploaded, and uh, I'll be back to streaming here momentarily. You guys have anything else you want to add?
I'm good. That's going to do it for episode number 13. Again, if you want any more information hey, about the Elder Scrolls Online, you can visit ElderScrollsOnline.com for more information there. Great Architect, uh, that is the gaming community that myself and a friend, Seeing Blue, we created it. We're uh, you know, going towards the recruiting now. We want more members in the guild. We got Great Architect, and we got Messiah Complex. That's a couple of guilds that's in the community that's going to be playing the Elder Scrolls Online at launch. So if you guys are interested or need a guild home, we encourage you guys to come over to greatarchitect.us. Go ahead and submit you an application over there. Get the full membership abilities, being able to use the TeamSpeak server, things like that. Interact with our streamers. You know, come in, ask questions. You know, I'll be streaming this weekend. I'm, I'm more than happy to take any kind of questions you guys have. We'll get you some answers. If you, if I don't know the answers, then you know I, I give a huge amount of credit to Laidum, Dubba, Curse, Crave, Tendaval. Uh, Pandlement, I mean, the, the list is on and on. You know, that there is just so many guys that is available in this community that knows their stuff to this game. And we've done some long term testing. You know, we're we may not be entire experts on everything, but you know, we use them to uh, to look into this stuff. So, again, if you want to check us out, interested in joining the community, please go over to greatarchitect.us, submit an app. You know, go ahead and get in, involved with us. Whenever the game goes live, the guild will be active. You know, we'll be glad to add you to the guild. It doesn't matter what alliance you choose. If you want to be in the guild, you can be in the guild. And, uh, you know, that that's the point, is we want to make sure you have uh, resources available to help you and get your questions answered. That's going to do it for episode number 13. I appreciate everybody being in here and, uh, you know, the support that I'm getting from the entire community, YouTube, just everybody all in all you know i've gotten a lot of compliments over this series and even the guys that are submitting additional videos tend to ball and crave you know they're both putting videos out there with a lot of information on it a lot more quickly than what i'm doing uh but you know it's all good information i really do appreciate them so that's going to wrap it up next saturday 9 30 p.m Eastern, the night blade and the sorcerer We'll look for any kind of additional information that Zenimax squeaks out uh, before launch. Get that included, and uh, we'll we'll go from there. But uh, ESO is upon us, guys. It is the time is here. Again, thank you very much. You guys have a good night. I'll be back momentarily with a live stream, playing some PTS, running some dungeons. Thank you, guys, very much.